Hello. Nice, friendly faces. Oh, that was fast. You guys are trained, aren't you? <laughs> Thank you so much, and welcome to our Block Leader program. Tonight's program is possible, of course, with the support of our city council and our management, and of course, my coworkers, our team. And so I want to give a really quick shout out to Stephanie Torini, who's in the back, our Neighborhood Watch Coordinator. <laughs> <laughs> Stephanie is always there for your Neighborhood Watch meetings, so don't forget to see her. Alex Corbalis is in the back, and she's in purple. She's kind of waving in the back. <laughs> And Justin Cecil in the black shirt. And they're part of our new senior center, or our new senior center team. So it's just um, very great to have them aboard and our experts in catering. Uh, we also have the city channel here, Robert Kim, and also Reynaldo Delgado at the back of the camera. The City Channel has graciously offered to record this session, and our presenter, Mike Robbins, has agreed. We are going to be running it on the City Channel, and we are going to be carrying some uh, parts on YouTube as well, correct? Yes, Robert's saying yes. Okay, so for especially for those of you who want to hear it again, and for those of us who couldn't make it. We welcome our longtime leaders here tonight. We welcome our brand new leaders, our city employees, commissioners, Leadership 95014, city volunteers, and their guests. For those attending for the first time to our Block Leader program, we started 13 years ago, and now we are 380 leaders strong today. Yay. And if I could pick on two people in the audience, I know some of our very new, new, new block leaders who joined within the last uh, month or two are sitting right at that table. Shravanti, if you could just wave your hand. And also Usha in the back, if you could wave her hand as well. Each leader has volunteered in our block leader program to help improve communication in our neighborhoods, whether it's by organizing block parties, setting up neighborhood watch, or emergency training meetings, or going door to door to meet neighbors and introducing themselves. They're invaluable to our Cupertino community, and they truly help our neighbors become acquainted and connected. Our block leaders meet quarterly on a variety of topics and to exchange best practices with peers. So I'm excited to introduce our featured presenter, Mike Robbins. I had the pleasure to hear Mike speak at a conference last fall, and I thought you would enjoy his very inspiring message, which could be useful at home, at work, and of course in our neighborhoods. Mike Robbins is the author of three books, Focus on the Good Stuff, Nothing Changes Until You Do, and Be Yourself, Everyone Else is Already Taken, which has been translated into 14 different languages. He delivers keynotes and seminars for some of the top organizations and municipalities in the, in the country. He and his family live right here in the Bay Area, and his clients include Google, Wells Fargo, Adobe, Gap, Twitter, Kaiser, Microsoft, Citibank, Taco Bell, the San Francisco Giants, and many others. He has also spoken at events for the cities of San Jose, San Francisco, and Mountain View, as well as the states of California, Florida, Arizona, and Nevada, and the IRS, and the US Department of Labor. I love the IRS. <laughs> you guys may know have that background story on that, but Mike and his work have been featured in, in Forbes and, Fa and Fast Company, as well as on the Oprah Radio Network and ABC News. Since 2008, he has been a regular contributor to the Huffington Post. Please welcome Mike Robbins. Hi, Clark. All right, so how many of you have ever had something taken away from you in your life only to realize how much you appreciated it after it was gone? 
All of us, right? So I'm going to talk a bit about the keys to creating a championship team and how I came to understand and really be aware of some of the stuff I'm going to share this evening came through an experience where I learned a lot about appreciation and that was when something really important to me got taken away and that was my professional baseball career. So I was a baseball player growing up. I grew up in Oakland, um, played baseball all as a kid into high school. I was pretty good. I actually got drafted out of high school by the New York Yankees. I didn't end up signing with the Yankees because I got an opportunity to play just up the road at Stanford. So I go to Stanford, play baseball there, then I get drafted out of Stanford by the Kansas City Royals. And I sign a pro contract. And the way that it works in baseball, as many of you probably know, you get, if you get drafted by a major league team and sign a contract, you have to go into what's called the minor leagues, right? And there's a bunch of different levels of the minor leagues. You have to kind of work your way up to actually get to the major leagues. It's a pretty involved process. So I was in the minors with Kansas City, working, trying to work my way up to get to the major leagues, doing pretty well. I was a pitcher. I went out to pitch one night, my third season, still in the minors. I tore ligaments in my elbow, and I put my arm out. So just like that, I was 23 at the time. I had started playing baseball when I was seven. My career ended. Now, it didn't end like instantaneously. It was the summer of 1997. I was playing out on the East Coast, and the season ended. They sent me back here to California. I had an operation on my arm that summer. I ended up having three operations over the next two years. Did everything I possibly could to try to come back and play baseball because I loved it. Unfortunately, after all the surgeries were done and I'd done everything the doctors and the physical therapists and everybody told me to do, I wasn't able to make it back to where I needed to be to continue to play. And as you can probably imagine, I was pretty upset, right? I was devastated. I mean, this had been the focus of my life, right? What am I going to do now? What am I, right? But as I was going through that process of trying to figure out what I was going to do next, I was reflecting on the experience and looking back at the whole experience and I started to ask myself some questions as you do when you go through an experience like that, right? I started to ask myself a bunch of different things. And one of the questions that I asked over and over again as I looked back on the whole experience of playing baseball was, did I have any regrets? You know, if I could do it, anything different. If I could do it all over again, what would I do different? And I realized I didn't regret a lot of the stuff I thought I would have. The bad games that I had, you know, the times I really messed up, and all the stuff I got really stressed out about while I was playing, I didn't... None of that stuff mattered to me anymore. The only regret that I had was that I didn't fully appreciate it while it was happening. I was too busy trying to make it. Right? I was this kid from Oakland, raised by a single mom. We didn't have a lot of money. I was going to make it to the major leagues. I was going to make some money. I was going to be somebody. But up to that point in my life, even though I was pretty good, I spent most of my time thinking I wasn't good enough, comparing myself to everyone around me, and literally, like, holding my breath hoping that I didn't mess it up. And when it was all said and done and I hadn't made it, I thought to myself, oops, I think I missed the point. How many of you can relate to this in your own life in some way? Right? Our stories may be different, our backgrounds may be different, but one of the things we have a tendency to do, particularly in our culture and we focus so much on where we're headed, is that we sometimes in the process of that miss out on where we actually are. Right? We don't actually often notice a lot of the good stuff that's going on in our own lives or even in our community until something really bad happens. And so for me, it was a pretty painful way to learn a really important lesson at a relatively young age. Now, I didn't know the full significance of the lesson, but I moved back here. I get a job. It was the 90s. You know, I get a job in the dot-com world because that's kind of what was going on at the time. And I worked for an internet company up in San Francisco and then went to go work for a startup. And this was going to be great because we were all going to get rich because it was going to go public. And then the dot-com bubble burst, and I lost my job. And now I'm like, man, what's going on, right? But something I noticed that was interesting, and whether you've played sports or been involved with sports or not in your life, I'm sure all of you have had this experience. Have you ever been on a team or been part of a team, a community team, a work team, something, family, church, anywhere? You've been part of a team where, like, the talent on the team was really strong, but the team wasn't very good. You had that experience before? And it doesn't make sense, right? You look around and you go, I got a lot of good people on this team. What's the matter? Why aren't we a very good team? And on the flip side, have you ever been part of a team or part of a group where it wasn't like every single person on the team was an, was an absolute rock star? I mean, they were good, but, right? But something about the team just kind of worked. Have you ever had that experience? And it's just, I don't know what it is. We just, it works, and we just, we get, we get along, we communicate, we understand each other, we know we, we bring out the best in each other, right? I'd always been fascinated by this phenomenon. In sports, we call that chemistry. Now, no one can quite define what it is. You know it when you have it. You know when you don't have it. 
And I always thought that that was a sports thing. And then I get into the business world, and I get out into the community a little bit, and then I realize, oh, no, no, that has nothing to do with sports. That has to do with human beings. In the business world, we call it culture. It's the same thing. It's the same thing in a community. It's the same thing in a police department. It's the same thing anywhere in a family. That chemistry, that culture. And I started to get curious about that because I wanted to understand, what is that? Is there a way to define that? Is there a way you can create that? Are there certain components that make that possible? And, I started to be interested in and this was 15 or so years ago, and it's what prompted me to actually start my consulting business, which I've had for the last 15 years. And I've had a chance, as Laura mentioned, to work with some really amazing companies here in the Bay Area and around the country, some great cities and state federal agencies, and through the course of all my research and what I found through my own experience as an athlete all those years and then now some of the study that I've done, but more importantly, working with teams and groups and leaders of all different types from all different types of backgrounds and communities, that there are a few really specific things that are pretty simple, that when we understand these things and not just understand them but actually practice them, we can really create what I like to call a championship team around us. And it's not always easy, particularly if we're the one trying to lead that or influence other people, but the more we practice ourselves, the easier it becomes to influence the people around us. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to talk about three things. I've written three books. I'm going to pull kind of one theme from each of my books and bring it into this evening's conversation about how you can inspire and impact the people around you and really create and or enhance the championship teams around you that are most important to you. The first thing we're going to focus on is mindset. Our own personal mindset. How do we deal with change? How do we deal with challenge? How do we deal with all the things that are going on in our lives and the people around us on a daily basis? The second thing we're going to focus on is authenticity. Again, simple concept, not always easy to practice. And the third thing is appreciation. So mindset, authenticity, appreciation. Those three things. When leaders and members of teams and groups and communities really take responsibility for the mindset that they're bringing to whatever it is they're doing, when we're able to operate, communicate, a sense of authenticity, and when we appreciate the people around us, amazing things can happen. So again, simple ideas, not stuff you don't understand already, I realize that. But sometimes these things, as simple as they are to understand, they're not always easy to practice. So we're going to talk a little bit about what they are, but more importantly, why are they tricky? What gets in the way of that? And then how do you bring forth some stuff in a genuine way, all right? And I got two promises for our time this evening, all right? Two promises here from my presentation. And I'll ask you before I'm done, so you got to tell me the truth if I fulfill these promises, okay? Will you tell me the truth? Okay, promise number one, we'll have some fun. You interested in having some fun? Okay, cool. And even for those of you watching the video later, hopefully you'll have some fun as well. Promise number stuff that we talk about here tonight, you'll be able to take some stuff from this that you can actually use in your real life, in your real work, in work you do here in the city as a block leader and all the other many things you do in your life as a way to inspire and empower the people around you and yourself to really be part of that championship team. Cool? Everybody up for that? You sure? All right. I'm just checking. Okay, cool. So let's start with this. So what I'd love for you to do is think about, again, many of you in here are block leaders or part of this block leaders program. You're all connected, obviously, to the city here in different capacities. Think about the work that you do specifically as a volunteer and or with the city directly. Some of you, obviously, are city employees. Think of the work that you do specifically on a daily basis in that capacity and talk, pair up with someone at your table and talk a little bit about what are some of the biggest challenges and frustrations and stress factors that you face. Any of you got any of those? All right, pair up with someone and talk about that, okay? Okay, start to wrap up. Okay, go ahead and stop. Go ahead and stop. All right, so hopefully a number of you got to talk a little bit. Even if you didn't get a chance to talk, hopefully you had a chance to think a little bit about what are some of the challenges or stress factors or frustrations that you face in the work that you do specifically here with the city. I'd love to hear from a few of you. 
This is the interactive part. Yeah, OK. <laughs> yes? So look so as a, as a volunteer as, as a block leader looking for other people to get involved. Yeah. So how do you get people involved to come and volunteer, right? Not not always easy to recruit people, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's a challenge. What else? What else? Yeah. Yes. So the challenge of people wanting to keep their information confidential, and then ha and that creates a challenge in terms of being able to communicate stuff. Yes. So it creates a bottleneck. If they only want the communication to come through you, then all of a sudden it's not as transparent or maybe at times as efficient as it could be, right? OK. What else? Other challenges, other frustrations? Yes. Yeah. 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 Right, right. So just introducing ourselves to our neighbors, right? Not the easiest thing for the most part. Look, I mean, life and community has evolved over the years. People come knocking on our door. What do you want? What are you selling? What's going on? What's the catch? What's the, right? I mean, like, right? For, for a variety of obvious reasons, people are a little bit can be standoffish or concerned, and so that, I imagine, poses a problem for you guys for sure. Now, look, here's the thing. And if we expand this out, if I said, let's do this, have this conversation again, now talk about anything in your life. Talk about your family, talk about jobs and things, and you'd probably have a lot of stuff to talk about, right? Stress factors, challenges, situations, right? How many of you find, though, here's the thing, and everything you just talked about, it's completely leg legitimate. You know better than I do some of the specific challenges and frustrations that you face on a daily basis. But how many of you ever find yourself complaining about the stuff you just talked about? You ever find yourself doing that? Or how many of you find yourself complaining about other stuff, too? We all do it, right? We complain. Now, there's nothing inherently evil about complaining. It's very human. We do it, right? We do it. And, and sometimes some of the stuff we're complaining about is genuinely frustrating, challenging, and right? warranting of complaining, so to speak. But here's the thing about complaining. It doesn't work. It doesn't, really. And you know, if you think about this, if you ever ask, and I ask people this all the time, a really successful or fulfilled individual, particularly a team, and I ask them, hey, what's the key to your success? I have never, in all my years of doing this, ever heard someone say, complaining, right? We just wind our way right to the top. It was amazing, right? We just kept complaining and complaining and complaining, and then magically everything got better. It doesn't work that way. And in fact, look, not that there's not legitimacy to some of our complaints, but most of the time we're doing what I call idly complaining, meaning we're not talking to anybody or about anything that can make anything better. I'm just complaining to you about this thing that's bugging me, or this person that's bugging me, or this situation that I don't like. And while I'm completely entitled to have that complaint, I'm a human being, I live in a free country, I can say what I want, me complaining to you about it isn't probably going to make it any better. Because all you're going to either do is agree with me, or even better, top me with your complaint, right? Oh, yeah, you think that's bad? Let me tell you how bad it is for me, right? <laughs> Thing, which is kind of an insane conversation, but we have that conversation all the time. And what's interesting about it, though, is again, it seems like a simple thing, but it's profound when we start thinking about the groups, the teams, the communities in which we were in. Because a lot of times, Look, and the work that you're doing, the important work you're doing in the community, in the neighborhood, you're focused on some issues that are important. You're focused on things, you're trying to keep people safe, we're trying to focus on some things that people may have legitimate complaints and concerns about. However, as a leader, and as a human being, if you want to influence other human beings in a positive way, complaining is not the route in which to do it. Not if you really want to inspire and empower them. And so what you want to start paying attention to for yourself Again, not from some holier-than-thou moral place. You're human. You're going to complain, just like I do, just like we all do. But start to pay attention to it, because it's kind of like eating unhealthy food. It may taste good in the moment, 
But over time, it's like, oh, it's probably not the most sustaining for me, the most fulfilling, the m healthiest way for me to operate, right? And now, how many of you ever find in your life, in the work that you do here in the city or just in general, you ever deal with people who get on your nerves? Anybody? <laughs> yes. It happens, right? People get on our nerves. But I, I had a really interesting conversation with a mentor of mine a few years ago. I was talking to her about a bunch of people that were getting on my nerves, right? And she's great. She listens to me. She gives me really great counsel. And so I'm talking to her about all these people and this person and this person. And I had lots of very legitimate complaints about these people who were bugging me and if they would just, right? And she listened to me for a few minutes, and then finally she stopped, stopped me, and said, okay, Mike, I've been listening. I understand you're frustrated. She said, but I have a very important question to ask you. I said, what's that? She said, who's always at the scene of the crime? I said, what? She said, who's the common denominator in all those relationships? I said, oh, that would be me. She said, that's right. She goes, you keep thinking that if those people would change, or if those, I was complaining about some situations that were bugging me too, those circumstances would change, and you keep thinking that if all that stuff changed, then everything would work out. She said, it actually works the other way around. And then she said something very simple but profound to me. She said, nothing changes until you do. And it wasn't like I'd never heard the concept before, maybe even the phrase before, but something about it at that particular moment in my life, given what I was dealing with, the people I was dealing with, I just, ooh, it like hit me right between the eyes, and I went, ooh, she's right. It actually inspired the title of my most recent book, Nothing Changes Until You Do. And what this is all about, again, is our mindset. How do we approach the things that we have to deal with? How do we approach the, do you have challenges in your life? Of course you do. Do you have challenges in the work that you're doing here in the city as a volunteer, as an employee? trying to keep people safe, trying to engage the neighbors and community, trying to get people more involved. Of course, I imagine that is rife with all kinds of challenges. The question isn't whether we have challenges or not. The question is, how do we relate to them? How do we deal with them? You know, one of my baseball coaches at Stanford used to say this to us all the time. As we would talk about baseball, right? Where they were playing baseball, he said, men, there's only two things in baseball that you can control. He said, this is true in life too, but we'll just focus on baseball. Two things, your attitude and your effort. That's it. Everything else is some version of out of your control. You can't control the weather. You can't control the umpire. You can't control your other teammates. You can't control whether you score a lot of runs or don't or what the other team does or all the variable factors in a game like baseball, but just using that as a metaphor for life. There's so many things that are out of our control. And if you think about some of the stuff that we complain about, not just specifically related to the work you do here at the city, but in your life in general. A lot of our complaints are things that we have no control over, or at least a limited control over. And if we really bring it back to, wait a minute, I can focus on my attitude, and I can focus on my effort. How I'm relating to things and what I'm doing. How I'm relating to things and what I'm doing. Everything else is some version of out of my control, which is part of what at times makes it frustrating. We can't force other people to do the things we want them to. That's not what leadership's about anyway. It's about inspiring other people. And we can't force the circumstances and situations to line up exactly the way that we want them to. It would be nice if we could, but we can't. Does that make sense? So then the question becomes sort of what do we do and how do we focus our mindset in the most effective way possible? There's a professor actually at Stanford named Carol Dweck who some of you may have heard of, and her whole body of work is focused on what she calls growth mindset. And I've been studying some of her work in the last few years and finding it fascinating. And here's essentially what growth mindset is. Growth mindset is about looking at challenge, at difficulty, at problems that show up for us that we don't quite understand or know how to figure out, but looking at it from the standpoint of how can I address this and learn and grow in the process? Fixed mindset is about having the right answer all the time, getting it right. The problem with fixed mindset, and we all have both in us, both growth and fixed mindset, is that fixed mindset, when we're dealing with certain complex or even some more mundane problems or situations or maybe stuff we haven't done before, or haven't dealt with or something, it's very difficult to get it right when there's a bunch of variables involved. And then it creates so much stress for us because we're trying to do it perfect and we're trying to get it right and we're trying to have the right answer. And what happens is we're unwilling to see things outside of a very limited scope when we come from that fixed mindset place. Growth mindset is, wow, great, here's the situation. Maybe it's frustrating me. Maybe it's new. Maybe it's challenging. Maybe I don't understand it. Maybe I don't even like it. 
But I know and trust that if I engage in it, I'm going to become better, stronger, more valuable, more aware, something in the process of engaging in it. And just that alone, if that's how we engage with something, we're more likely to find creative solutions. We're more likely to keep a more positive attitude. We're more likely to get less stressed out by it if that's our approach versus a fixed mindset. Does that make sense? Here's another way to think about it. Because here's a conversation that I had with a friend of mine years ago that profoundly impacted my life and really helped me. As I was dealing with, you know, the end of my baseball career and trying to figure out what am I going to do next, and, you know, as difficult of a practical process as that was, I had to, like, what am I going to do to make money and live and all those, that's a big practical thing. It was more, how am I going to deal with this mentally, emotionally? And I had this friend say this thing to me. He said, you know, Mike, when you go through a difficult time in life or you have something happen to you that seems like it's not fair or it's challenging or, you know, big things, small things, he said, there's a question that we often ask ourselves when that happens, and it makes sense, but it just doesn't usually help. And here's the question we ask. Why is this happening to me? Right? Why did this happen to me? Now, we, don't, may, we may say that out loud. We may not. It's not the nicest thing to say out loud. We might just ask in our own mind. And basically, he said, that's a very normal, natural human response to a situation. He said, but if you think about it, that's really the fundamental question of the victim. Why did this happen to me? Why is this happening to me? He said, if you just change one word in that question, just one, it'll fundamentally change not only how you're relating to the situation, but it could change your life. He said, change the word to to the word for. Why is this happening for me? What's here for me? That's growth mindset. Why is this happening for me? What's the opportunity here? Right? Look, it's easier to see with other people. You have people in your life. Maybe it's a young person. Maybe it's someone you know. And you can see, wow, this is a situation. Yeah, maybe it's not easy. It's not that fun. But, whoa, there's so much growth and learning for them if they just engage in it. But they're so busy being upset about it or being sort of victimized by whatever's going on. It's harder to see when it's us because it doesn't seem like we're doing it to ourselves. It genuinely seems like, no, it's wrong. It's bad. It's not fair. It shouldn't be that way. But so much of it is a function of our mind and how we're relating to it. Because all of us, look, how many of you have had an experience in your life that at the time it happened, it seemed terrible, but in hindsight, you look back now and you go, oh, what a blessing. We've all had that happen. The challenge is being able to have that same relationship to things as they're happening. Why is this happening for me? Why is this happening for me? Even something mundane, some challenge of people won't open their doors, or how do I recruit people, or what about this, or what about that, or how do we communicate more effectively, or how do we deal with all the different things that are going on, from the big stuff to the small stuff. But if we start paying more attention to our mindset and how we're approaching things, that has everything to do with our ability to solve the problem. I'll give you one more example about this, then I'm going to have you talk to your partner. Because it can show up even on day-to-day -day stuff, simple stuff. Now, how many of you have ever been around a two-year-old? Anybody been around a two-year-old before? Okay, if you haven't been around a two-year-old, it's a great experience, by the way. If you want to practice a lot of mental and emotional approaches to life, hang out with a two-year-old, because they're amazing teachers, right? Now, my wife, Michelle, and I have two girls, who are now nine and seven. But we had, I had this funny thing happen. Michelle called me one day when Anna Rose, our youngest, was two. And Michelle calls me on the phone, laughing hysterically to tell me what had just happened. Now, she was with the girls. And at the time, Samantha, my older daughter, was four and a half. Anna Rose was two. And she was just trying to get them out of the house, into the car, to go to the store. Not a big deal, right? But if you've ever been around a two-year-old, you know, sometimes something like that becomes a major production. Because at this point in Anna Rose's development, she decided she did not like her car seat. She didn't want to get in the car. So that was what was going on. So now her sister Samantha had gone through exactly the same thing around the same time. And we'd learned a few things. It still wasn't the easiest thing in the world to deal with. But so anyway, as soon as Anna Rose knew that we had to go anywhere, she'd start throwing a fit. I don't want to go. I don't want to go. I don't want to get in the car. Because it was this thing. Something about the car seat was very upsetting to her. So anyway, Michelle telling me the story. And what happened was she's trying to get the girls out the door. And Anna Rose, of course, does not want to go. You know, the whole bit, she's throwing a fit in the house. Now she finally gets them dressed, gets them all ready to go, gets them outside, and Anna Rose is now throwing a fit on the lawn, which is even worse now, out in front on the lawn, now all the neighbors, and oh my goodness, and this whole thing, and my wife, who's very calm and very composed, is now starting to lose it a little bit, but trying in public to kind of keep it together. Come on, let's get in the car. Finally gets her in the car, and now she won't get in the car seat, and she's on the floor of the car. 
right, arching her back and doing the whole thing. And two-year-olds, as little as they are, unbelievably strong and willful at times, right? And here's Michelle, and she tells me, and this is in the middle of the summer, she's like, I'm dripping sweat, I'm trying to, and I'm getting, get in the course, in the whole thing, right? And it's going on, and it's getting more escalated and more escalated. And Michelle says, I'm starting to lose it. I don't know what to do. I just start sna- the whole bit. Now, Samantha, on the other hand, is sitting in her little booster seat, all buckled in, very calm, just watching the whole thing happen, right? Now, she, again, she used to do the exact same thing at the time. Now, at this time, right around this time in Samantha's development, one of the things that Michelle was working with her on, and she, her, as, me as well, was what to do in case of an emergency. So in the middle of this whole ordeal, as Michelle can't get Anna Rose into the car seat, the whole thing, Samantha very calmly says, Mommy, I can go inside and call 911. <laughs> to which, of course, Michelle starts hysterically laughing. Laughing so much, she's like, oh my gosh, I thought I was going to like pee in my pants. I'm laughing so much, I'm not even paying attention. And the next thing, I, when I finally sort of gather myself, I turn around to look, and Anna Rose has climbed up, and she's now sitting in her car seat, waiting to be buckled in. And Michelle says to me, maybe my approach (laughs) wasn't working so well. (laughs) But that's often what we do, right? We get more frustrated and more frustrated and more frustrated, and the person or the situation or whatever we're frustrated with resists. And if we can actually just let go and shift our whole perspective, sometimes, not always, sometimes it kind of starts to resolve itself. And at the very least, our perspective is such that we can see other opportunities for how we might be able to address the situation. So here's what I'd like for you to do. Turn back to your partner. I know some of you were talking at the whole table, but if you can pair up, it's better just because then more people get a chance to talk. Talk a little bit about some of the challenges or frustrations you were talking about just a few minutes ago, and see if you can just speculate on what might be some ways you could shift your mindset about those same things. Does that make sense? What could you do to shift your perspective, your approach, your attitude towards the things that are frustrating you in a way that might be beneficial? Does that make sense? All right, so chat with your partner for a few minutes and then we'll move on. Go ahead and stop. Okay. All right, so... um, How many of you could see some places where you might be able to shift your mindset or your approach? Okay. Anybody got any questions or any comments or anything about this before we move on to the next piece? Does this make sense? Again, like a lot of the stuff I'm I'm going to talk about this evening, this is simple. It's just not easy. It's simple to understand. Oh, yeah, yeah, my attitude, my perspective, my mindset, yeah. Oh, but, and it's not always easy because we get really attached to our perspective instead of realizing that a lot of the stuff we choose. Right? The circumstances happen in our lives. The circumstances are going on around us in the work that we do. We get to choose how we respond to it. And as simple of an idea as that is, that is not easy to practice. But the more we start to really get that and practice that, the more autonomy, the more power we have in our lives. And the less we give our power away to the circumstances, the situations, and the people around us. And then from that place, if we're operating from that place, we can actually coach, give feedback to, and influence the people around us in that same way. Make sense? Okay, so that's mindset fundamental piece to championship teams. Because look, any team, any group is made up of individuals. So how we operate, and particularly as leaders, as people who want to influence other people, our mindset and our approach has a big influence and impact on other people, whether we're conscious of it or not. The second aspect we're going to focus on here is authenticity. Authenticity. It's a word that gets uh, used quite a bit these days. But it's something that I find in, in the work that I've done, and I One of the books I wrote is called Be Yourself, Everyone Else Has Already Taken. It's all about authenticity. And I wrote this book back in 2008. It came out in 2009. I've been studying and researching and talking to people about authenticity for many years. And what's interesting is I find that there's a lot of different understandings of what authenticity actually means. So when you hear the word authentic or think of authenticity, what does it mean to you? What comes to mind? What does it mean to be authentic? Original. What else? Honest, tell the truth. What else? Real. 
genuine, real. Else, not fake. Forthright. Absolutely. You know, it's interesting. I mean, it means all of those things and much more. But what's interesting is, again, sometimes I think we misconstrue what it means, particularly interpersonally. I remember I gave a speech. This was a number of years back, actually, right after my authenticity book came out. And after I got done with the speech, I get off stage, and I, I'm sort of walking around, and this woman comes up to me. She makes a beeline right over to me, and she gets right in my face, and she says, I'm authentic, I'm authentic all the time. <laughs> and I was like, okay. <laughs> but she was like upset. I said, well, what's the problem? And she said, well, I've lost some jobs because of that. I said, really? She said, yeah, not everybody can handle it. Now, at this point, right, I did not know this woman, but I was now getting a pretty strong sense of her personality, right? <laughs> And I'm not sure what prompted me to ask her this somewhat provocative question, but I did. I looked her right in the eye and I said, now tell me the truth. Is it authentic or obnoxious? <gasps> and she was like momentarily I, a little stunned and probably a little offended. But I could kind of tell her, at least I was hoping, that based on her personality, she'd probably appreciate the banter and my sort of quick response back to her. And she says, well, maybe a little bit of both. And I said, all right, I, I appreciate the honesty, I appreciate the self-awareness. I said, but, you know, I don't know for sure, but if I had to guess, I bet it was the obnoxious that got you fired, not the authentic. Because we don't get fired or really have a major problem oftentimes by being too authentic. Because what authenticity is really about is realness, genuineness. It's difficult, almost impossible, to be too real, too genuine. Now, we do get in trouble at times by the things that we do and say, clearly. So let's break this down, because authenticity on the surface can seem pretty simple, it's, but it's not as black and white as it seems. I always think of it on a continuum. On this side of the continuum is where we'll put phony, inauthentic. We all know what that looks like, we know what that feels like, you know what it's like to interact with someone else when it's, they're being inauthentic, or at least it seems that they're being inauthentic, right? Difficult to trust, difficult to connect with, diff just challenging, off-putting, right? However, while it's easy, and we love to point fingers, don't we, at people being inauthentic? Especially these days, oh, we love to point fingers at politicians, we love to point fingers at business leaders, we, oh, he, she, celebrity, whoever it is, inauthentic, inauthentic, we're like the inauthentic police pointing out who's inauthentic and how offended we are by that. But a more valuable place to actually take a look, particularly for you as a leader, is start paying attention to when and where and why you find yourself being inauthentic. Because how you gain your capacity to be more authentic is start telling the truth about when you're not and really looking at why. And usually it's not malicious. It's not like we wake up in the morning and say to ourselves, ha ha ha, I'm gonna lie to everybody today. I'm going to deceive people, I'm going to manipulate. No, it's not like that. We're either just trying to get what we want. We're trying to have some influence. We're trying to cover our you-know-what. We're trying to not look bad. We're trying to, right? Sometimes it's because it's awkward or it's uncomfortable. Right? Even in those moments, like I knock on the door and they don't want to open the door. What do I do? What do I say? How do I respond? It may not be the most authentic response. It may be just I'm trying to protect myself and save face. Look, we can do it in all kinds of benign ways that we're not even that conscious about. I'll give you an example of something that you and I do every day that's completely inauthentic. What do we say to each other when we greet each other? What's the question that we ask? How are you? Now, some of you, I imagine, are not originally from here, not just the Bay Area, but maybe not even from the United States. And many people I talk to who are from other places in the world find this to be very odd. But it's like a social norm that we do in the Bay Area, around the country, that's one of the things that we do as Americans. We greet each other, hello, how are you? And what's the response? I'm fine, I'm good, I'm stressed. I'm, it's some one word answer that never close to encapsulates how we're actually doing, but that's what you're supposed to do. By the way, have you ever asked the question and someone really answered and you're like, oh, sorry I asked, right? <laughs> it wasn't really asking, what are you doing answering? Stop that, you're not playing by the rules, right? But the truth is, again, it's not malicious. It's actually a really kind thing. What I'm trying to say is, hello, how are you? Nice to see you. I'm trying to be friendly. I maybe genuinely am interested. Usually I'm too busy to really even wait for you to answer because I've got to get on to the next thing I'm doing, right? 
And our response back is usually we're trying to be polite. I'm fine. I'm okay. I'm whatever, right? I don't really want to get into it right now because if I'm really, really happy, you might think I'm weird. If I'm really, really stressed out or upset, it might be too much for you. So I'll just say fine. I don't even know exactly what that means, but I'll just say it because that's what we say. And then we move along. But we don't walk away from that and I think, he's such a liar, right? I can't believe she asked me that when she doesn't really care. Oh, it's like no big deal. Hey, how you doing? I'm fine. See you later. Okay, great. Bye. But that's just an example. No big deal, no harm, no foul. We didn't hurt anybody's feelings. We didn't offend anybody. But that's a perfect example of how unconscious we are at times about our inauthentic behavior. And the reality is this. Look, if we want to have influence on people, you want to build trust, you want people to follow your lead. Look, we all get at some level. I'm not going to get there by being inauthentic. Because here's the deal. We've all even had this experience. Have you ever had this happen in the course of your life? You're trying to influence someone. You're trying to make something happen. You're working really hard at it, and you go about it in a way that, while may not be unethical, when you really assess the whole situation, you even get the result you wanted. Hey, it turned out, I got what I wanted. But you look back, and you honestly think about it, and look at yourself in the mirror and say, I probably could have gone about that differently. That maybe wasn't the most authentic way. I got what I wanted, I'm glad about that. I didn't break any laws, I didn't hurt anyone, I didn't do anything awful along the way, but you know, because again, we live in a culture that's so focused on the outcome of things that we're not always focused on the process by which we go about things. And here's the deal. Great teams, great leaders, of course they're interested in the outcome. But they're also very much interested in the process. Because sometimes what happens is we get stuff done, or we produce the result, or we make it happen, but consciously or unconsciously we start to damage relationships along the way and we are, may or may not even be aware of that. And while we can't control people's opinions or perceptions about us, per se, we absolutely have full control over how authentic or inauthentic we show up. Now look, it's not always easy. There are certain people in situations, it's much harder for me to be authentic than in others. But that's where we want to start telling the truth. Because look, all the work that I do and have done for the last 15 years focuses essentially on what we call emotional intelligence. And what's emotional intelligence? Emotional intelligence is self-awareness and self-management. That's the first part of it. Can I be aware of myself and can I manage myself? Not easy to do, by the way. Because <laughs> we're all complex creatures. A lot going on. We got high moods and low moods. We got all kinds of stuff happening. And so we spend most of our lives, if we're paying attention, trying to understand ourselves a little bit better. And if you want to be a great leader, that's fundamentally important. The other part of emotional intelligence is social awareness and relationship management. Understanding situations, understanding people as best as you can. Even though we're all different and we're diverse and we come from different backgrounds, the more aware I am of you, what's going on, the more I can manage that relationship, the more effective I'm going to be. And look, this idea of emotional intelligence is fundamentally important. About 20 years ago, a guy named Daniel Goleman wrote a book called Emotional Intelligence. He didn't originate the idea, but he was a researcher. Scientists, psychologists took a lot of research, put it together, and basically said, his theory was 20 years ago, and this was radical at the time, that a leader's effectiveness, two-thirds of a leader's effectiveness is based on their emotional intelligence, or what he called emotional quotient, EQ. Only a third of it was based on their intellectual quotient, or their IQ, how smart they were. And that was like radical for the business world, for things in general, because what we thought and had thought for many, many years was like, if you were really good and smart and had all the skills, you could do your job, and not only do your job, but lead other people to do it, because that's what we needed. But in reality, and you've all had this experience in your life, personally and professionally, you were around someone who was really smart and talented, knew what they were doing, but they weren't very good with people. They weren't very inspiring. It wasn't like that fun to talk to them and be around them. And no matter how smart and talented they were, you're kind of like, I don't know if I want to hang out with you. I don't know if you can actually teach and inspire me because somewhere between your brain and your mouth and how it all comes out, it's not getting through over here. <laughs> That's emotional intelligence. And it's fundamentally important. So back to this whole notion of authenticity, you want to start to be self-aware enough to notice, okay, wh where do I find myself being inauthentic? And can I challenge myself? Because it's a choice. It's, look, is it harder with certain people in certain situations? Sure it is. But it's a choice. And people say things to me all the time, like, I can't really be authentic with my boss, or I can't really be authentic with this particular member of my community, or I can't really be authentic with my mother-in-law, or whoever it is, someone. 
They always have someone or something, you know, because they're not like that. Or it would, and I, my, my response back is often, listen, I understand, but I challenge you, you could be authentic. You're just choosing not to be. And maybe that's a completely appropriate choice, but own it as a choice. No one's forcing you to be inauthentic. And sometimes the way inauthenticity looks is that we just don't speak up. It's not that I'm saying or doing anything overtly inauthentic. I'm just not actually speaking up. I'm not voicing what's true for me. Or at least not in the meeting or not around the people involved, right? We all sit together at the meeting. Yeah, yeah, great, great. And then we leave the meeting and go, yeah, that's ridiculous. I'm not doing that. Or whatever. He's an idiot or she's whatever, blah, 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 right? We go out for drinks and talk about what we really think. That's how it often shows up in life. Particularly here in the Bay Area because, well, you know, nice. And down here in Silicon Valley, everything's awesome, right? Okay, you get what I'm talking about. So, so we're not going to hang out over here in inauthentic because we realize that's not going to really get me where I want. So let's move along the continuum to the midway point. This is where honest is. Now, honest is good, right? I mean, it's better than phony. But how many of you, my mom used to say this to me all the time, honesty is the best policy. Honesty, you ever, how many of you were taught some version of that? Just be honest. It's always better to be honest, yes. But how many of you have had the experience in the work you're doing right here at the city or in your life in general where you were honest about something <laughs> and it caused a problem. Yep, oops, you put your foot in your mouth, or someone said, no, 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 not that honest, not with him, what are you doing, right? And you're like, oh, sorry, my bad, okay. And then you start realizing, how honest can I be? And then we start massaging the truth, right? And then we want to be honest, mostly honest, you know, like politically correct honest. Like makes me look good honest doesn't offend people or ruffle feathers or have people think I'm a jerk honest. You know, that kind of honest. But here's the deal. Nothing inherently wrong with this is how we operate in life as humans in our culture. But look, on this side of the continuum, while this is the normal place that we mostly operate, there's not a lot of freedom and power over here. It takes a lot of energy. Because now I constantly have to remember, how honest can I be with you and how honest can I be with you and what am I supposed to say to you and who am I talking to? Oh, geez. Whew, that's a lot of energy. Where there's real freedom and power is on the other side of honesty. And look, for some of us, just having the courage to be honest is an enormous stretch. I get that. For most of us, based on our personalities or how we're raised or where we are or what's going on. But the problem is sometimes we think that authenticity is about the courage to speak up and be honest. And there's some of us, it's usually the minority, who have some ability to do that. We'll speak up, we'll challenge, we'll raise our hand and voice our opinion, but that's not what authenticity actually is. That's like the very basic level of it. Honesty is like the ticket to the party. You want to get to authenticity, which is over there, you've got to remove something from your honesty and you've got to add something to it. The thing you've got to remove from your honesty is your self-righteousness. Now, what do I mean by that? How many of you, like me, have a lot of opinions? Okay, how many of you, like me, think your opinions are right? <laughs> yes, that's the problem. Nothing wrong with your opinions. You're entitled to have your opinions. Nothing wrong with even speaking them up. If, you, if you're willing and courageous enough to speak your opinions, go for it. The issue isn't with your opinion. The issue is that you think your opinions are the truth. And as simple of an idea as this is, this is radically fundamental if you think about this in your life. Look, I come from a family where we speak our opinions like they're facts. I mean, I can literally remember my mother saying, I mean, stuff about benign stuff, but I was raised in a house where my mom would say stuff like this. That's a bad movie. Anybody who likes it is an idiot. It wasn't like my opinion or I think or other people have different perspectives. No, no, no. That's the deal. If you don't agree with me, you're wrong. And I, so I learned how to argue in my house. Because if you disagreed with my mother, you were in trouble, or you better have a good argument. So I had learned how to get, make good arguments. And that kind of served OK in my house, because we argued a lot, or I got in school. That's kind of good in school, making arguments. And, but then I like, got out in life, <laughs> got married, and realized you know, making arguments and winning arguments actually isn't always conducive to healthy and positive relationships. Because here's the deal, though. Righteousness, self-righteousness, is one of the most damaging energies that we carry as human beings. It fundamentally separates us from other people. Because if I'm right about something and you don't agree with me, what does that make you? Wrong. Look, look at the world we live in. Look at the culture, the communities. I mean, look, one of the biggest issues we're dealing with in our communities is righteousness. Us and them. Me and you. You're either on my side or their side. It's rampant everywhere. 
We have a hard time talking to each other when we disagree. We have a hard time hearing each other when we come coming from different perspectives. So this self-righteousness thing is big. I was at an event down in L.A. a couple months ago, and I was talking, and this woman came up to me after, and she said, you know, I'd never really thought about the righteousness piece. And then she told me, she said, you know, my mom is getting older, and um, my dad passed away a couple years ago, and my siblings and I were really trying to help my mom and support her, and, um, and it's frustrating because she's been pretty stubborn. She doesn't want to move, she doesn't want to do this, she doesn't want to, we're trying to help, she doesn't want to take our, you know, all these things. And she was going through the, and as she was talking about it, she started to get emotional about it. And she said, you know, I'm the oldest, I'm trying to do everything that I can to help my mother, and it makes me so angry sometimes, because I feel like she doesn't listen to me. And she won't take my advice, and she won't accept my, and, it, and she said, it never occurred to me that maybe part of the reason is because I'm so self-righteous about it. And I said to her, first of all, listen, I appreciate you sharing this with me. Obviously, you care about your mother and you love her a lot because you wouldn't have come up to talk to me about it if you didn't. And as, you know, she was having some tears and some emotion about it, I said, how do you really feel about what's going on? And she said, I feel scared because I don't know what's going to happen. And I feel like I can't help her. And I said, of course you do. That makes sense. I said, what if you just shared that with her? I said, because look, you know, I don't know your mom, I don't know the situation, I don't know all the advice you're giving her. I bet some of the advice you're giving is really, really good and could potentially help her. Potentially. But she probably can't hear it because of the righteousness. And for all of us as human beings, when people come at us with that self-righteous energy, no matter what they're saying, even if they're right, we don't want to hear it. Because it separates us from other people. Look, Martin Luther King said it this way. It's my favorite Dr. King quote. He said, we have no morally persuasive power with those who can feel our underlying contempt for them. We have no morally persuasive power with those who can feel our underlying contempt for them. So look, in the roles that you have, as block leaders, as community leaders, it's important work. I'm sure at times it's not easy work. You're dealing with people in situations and circumstances where there's threats, where there's stuff going on that's not okay, where you're trying to influence people, both people you want to get on, you're, all the different aspects of it, but you've got to pay attention, even in the good work that you're doing. If you get self-righteous about it, you will push people away from you. People won't listen to your ideas. They will be put off, not by what you're saying, but by where it's coming from. This happens all the time, and we're mostly unconscious about it. Because we don't think we're being self-righteous. We actually think we're right. And it's crazy-making. Literally. Have you ever had this happen? Think about with your spouse or with a family member. Have you ever been in the middle of the argument? This has happened to me. In the middle of the argument and realized you're actually wrong and they're right? <laughs> and if you're anything and as stubborn as me, you might keep arguing anyway, right? <laughs> and that's part of how the crazy human psyche and ego works, right? We will literally die to be right at times. And it doesn't serve us, especially if we want to influence and impact other people. So honesty without self-righteousness. Now, that is not an easy thing to do. You've got to pay attention to your self-righteousness. How do I remove it? I'm not saying water down your opinion. I'm not saying don't have passion. I'm saying remove the self-righteousness. Remove the thing that said someone made you the master of the universe and you're right about everything. Remove that. The thing you've got to add to it is vulnerability. Mm. Honesty without self-righteousness and with vulnerability that's authenticity. Vulnerability? Ah. We don't like vulnerability. We have a real negative connotation with that word and that idea. We think vulnerability is weakness. It's not. Vulnerability is risk. Emotional exposure. It's being real about who we are and how we actually feel. And while it is risky and can be quite uncomfortable, it is the opposite of weakness. In fact, it takes an enormous amount of courage to be vulnerable. Anything and everything that you've ever accomplished in your life that means anything to you, I promise, involve you being vulnerable, taking a risk, doing something you'd never done before. Right? Even something as simple but at times challenging as you brought up, going to knock on someone's door to introduce yourself and try to make a connection when they might say, Get away from me. I'm not opening the door. 
that takes some courage because that's a vulnerable act. Right? I'm a former athlete. Any of you who are sports fans, one of the reasons why any of us who like sports or think of the arts, you go to see someone perform. Why are we so inspired? Yeah, because they're talented and it's amazing because we know at some level they're taking a huge risk. Right? They're putting themselves out there. The football team plays over the weekend, right? The Niners, and they have a terrible game, and everybody, oh, can you imagine being Colin Kaepernick right now? The quarterback of the 49ers, who just had a really rough game after another rough game. I'm listening to the radio, and all these people calling in, yeah, I got a new quarterback. And I'm thinking, okay, you're entitled to your opinion, but how about you put on some pads and go do what he just did last weekend, right? Not the easiest thing in the world. But we all want to take shots and have opinions the day after. But are we willing to get in the arena and actually play? That takes an enormous amount of courage. That's vulnerability. So if you're willing to be honest and you remove your self-righteousness and you add vulnerability, now, whoo, now we're talking about authenticity. And here's the thing about authenticity and what I've learned in some of my research in the last few years about authenticity in particular. Number one, it's the key driver in human trust and connection. You can't build trust with other people without authenticity, particularly vulnerability. It's also the birthplace of innovation, of change, of creativity, of anything new and different. So we got to be able to embrace it. Now, is it uncomfortable? Yes, it is. But in life, particularly as a leader, you get to choose courage or comfort, <laughs> not both. So when we choose courage, what that means is it's going to be, it doesn't have to be super painful and awful and terrible, but it's going to be uncomfortable. That's how we grow. So here's the question I have for you. In your life right now, related to the work you do here at the city and in general, where are there some places where you be more authentic, take more risks, speak up a little more? I don't know, it's different for each of us, but every single one of us, there's some edge in your life, some place where you're stopped. Oops. What would it be like to step past that place? In your role as a block leader, in your role here in the city, or just in general? Turn back to your partner and talk a little bit about that before we move on, all right? Where could you be more authentic? Where could you take more risks? Talk a little bit with your partner about that, and then we'll move on. Okay, so... Um, How many of you see some places where maybe you could take a risk, step out of your comfort zone, lean more into authenticity? You see some places? Look, again, it's not always easy, right? It's uncomfortable, but you know, I think of something that uh, a mentor of mine said to me years ago, really simple, but profound. He said, Mike, you're living your life as though you're trying to survive it. I said, yeah. What's the problem with that? He said, you have to remember something really important. I said, what's that? He said, nobody ever has. <laughs> ever. Right? You and I are constantly trying to protect ourselves. Look, and there's a healthy side to that. It's what you do in the community. It's what we got to do to be smart and wise and understand. How, right? But at some level, we try to keep ourselves emotionally safe. Like, I'm not going to take a risk so that I don't look bad, so that I don't fail, so that I can survive. When in reality, the act of being human is vulnerable just by its sheer nature. And all of us, if you've lived enough life, we've all made mistakes, we've all fallen on our face, we've all done things we've regretted, but oftentimes if you think about the stuff you've regretted in your life, most often we don't regret taking too big of a risk. It's the stuff we don't suit up for. It's the game we're not willing to play. It's the conversation we're too scared to have. It's all those things that we pull ourselves back from when in reality, that's where it happens. You want to create a championship team around you? Want to really have influence? You want to make a difference in the community? It starts right where your comfort zone ends. And that's what it takes to be a leader. It's not for the faint of heart. Because when you're a leader, when you step forward, when you take a risk, when you try to do something that's going to make a difference, not everybody's going to like it or agree with it or understand it or congratulate you. I mean, sometimes that happens, but not always. And in fact, some people will slam the door in your face, literally, if not figuratively in lots of ways. 
And one of the things that we can do, so we talked about mindset, we talked about authenticity, but in terms of really creating the most healthy, positive team around us, also within our own minds, is focus on the good stuff. It's the title of the first book that I wrote. It's all about appreciation. Now, this isn't Pollyanna, pie in the sky, everything's great. The book's not called Everything's Good. It's called Focus on the Good Stuff. And that's actually a discipline. That's a practice. That's not an easy thing to do, particularly when you see some things around you that aren't so good. You know some of the challenges, some of the dangers, right? That's part of what you're doing. But can you make a commitment to yourself that I'm going to focus on and look for and find the good stuff, in particular in the people around me? Because it's one of the most important elements of inspiring and motivating other people. But one of the things that we get confused about in our culture, I see this in the business world where I do a lot of work, I see this in the public sector, in community groups and organizations, in schools, you name it, is that we focus, again, so much on outcomes and results, we confuse recognition and appreciation. They're related, but they're not the same. Here's what recognition is. Recognition is positive feedback based on results, based on performance based on some good outcome. Something good happens, we hopefully recognize it. Sometimes informally, sometimes more formally, but hey, it's reactive, it's important, it motivates people. If someone does a good job, if some, per look, you wanna get people to volunteer and engage more, if they get some recognition for engagement, they're more likely to show up because it is motivating, it makes people feel good. Hey, I'm getting recognized, it makes all of us, right? Appreciation, on the other hand, is about people. Recognition is about what people do, appreciation is about who people are. Recognition is about outcome and result. Appreciation is about value. Now, why is this important? Because sometimes in life, in the work that you do, in the communities where we are, in our families, in our workplaces, the results aren't always what we want them to be. People aren't always doing the things we want them to do, right? And if all we do is focus on recognition, then it's very reactive. I'm waiting for someone, right? Think of in school. This child who does a really good job gets a good grade, gets recognized. Hey, good job. The child who doesn't, what do we do? In the community. All the different places where this shows up. Now, why is this important? I'll give you an example from my baseball career, because this is the best way that I know to describe the difference between recognition and appreciation and to show why it's important. Now, whether you're a baseball fan or not, how many of you know what happens to the pitcher, which is the position that I played in the baseball game when the pitcher doesn't do well? Do you know what happens? They stop the game. And in front of everybody, the manager walks out to the mound and literally takes the ball from you and makes you leave. Let's just say you're in the middle of doing your work as a block leader at your workplace, wherever you're, you're in the middle of it. You're leading a meeting, you're in charge of something, and you're kind of like not doing so great. You're not having a good night, maybe you made a few mistakes, whatever, and literally in the middle of what you're doing, someone bursts in the room and says, you stop, come over here please and you have to stop doing whatever you're doing and walk out, and some other person comes in and starts doing your job for you right there. And oh, by the way, imagine thousands of people were watching this happen. You'd probably be pretty embarrassed, wouldn't you? That's what it's like as a pitcher to get taken out of the game. Now, if it's like, let's say it's like late in the game, it was like the eighth inning and I was getting a little tired, I mean, I never liked coming out, but at that point, the manager would come out, he'd say, hey, Robbins, you're getting a little tired, you know, you did a good job, but we're gonna get someone to replace you, okay. So I'd walk off the mound, I'd go into the dugout where all my teammates were, I'd get high fives from everybody, good job. But let's say it was like the second inning. And it was already seven to nothing. <laughs> that wasn't fun at all, because he'd come get me, he usually wouldn't say anything, or if he did, it wasn't very nice. And then I'd walk off the mound, upset, embarrassed, frustrated. And if we were on the road, you know, in the other team's ballpark, it was always worse. Because there'd be some mean, heckling fans right above the dugout saying horrible things about my mother, right? <laughs> Literally. And I would go sit down, and nobody would talk to me. Now look, the season's almost over, a couple games left. You can still turn on a Giants game or an A's game for the next couple days. But even if you're not a baseball fan, the playoffs are about to start, turn on a baseball game in the next month or so. There'll be lots of baseball on TV with the postseason. Watch what happens. It's like an unwritten rule in baseball. Pitcher does bad, comes out of the game. Oh, leave him alone, he's upset. But you know what I could have used when I was sitting on the bench after just giving up seven runs in the second inning? What do you think? 
pat on the back, right? Some kind of appreciation. Now, not recognition. What are they going to say? Hey, Robin's way to go, man. Seven runs. Ooh, not so bad. No. Appreciation isn't inauthentic recognition. I had just failed, not just for myself, but for the team. So look, your performance, people's performance, people's behavior, people's, the things people do, it matters. In the community, at work, in life, in school, you name it, on, on your block, all those things matter. The people who, the volunteers that work with you and for you in this effort, what they do matters, absolutely. However, what I could have used and almost never got in all those years of playing baseball was someone to come and actually appreciate me when I failed. There was nothing to recognize. I didn't deserve or want any recognition, but what I wanted was some appreciation, not for what I'd done, but for who I am. That's appreciation, who people are. Recognition is about what they do. Look, Oprah Winfrey said it this way. She said it beautifully. She said, I've interviewed thousands and thousands and thousands of people in my career. I've interviewed everybody. Presidents, prime ministers, celebrities, people who've done extraordinary things, people who've gone through horrific tragedies, everyday people. You name it, I've interviewed them. From all walks of life, she said, after almost every interview that I've ever conducted over all these years, do you know that almost everyone asked me some version of the same question when the interview's over? The camera shuts off, interview's over, they lean over and they say, how'd I do? How'd I do? How was that, right? And she said, you know, early in my career, I used to be confused by this because I'd be sitting across from someone who's very successful, very accomplished, seemed very confident, and I'd be wondering, are they really that insecure? What is that, right? Do they really need my validation? Like, what is going on? And then she said, I realized something. They're not actually asking me how they did. You know what they're really asking me? What they're really asking me, she said, is did you see me? Did you hear me? Did what I say matter? She said, everybody's asking those questions. No matter how successful or accomplished or competent they may seem, everyone, all of us, we want to know that we're seen, that we're heard, that who we are and what we do and what we say matters. If you're the kind of person, you're the kind of leader that sees people, hears people, and lets them know, yes, you matter. Not just because you did something great, not just because we're friends or I like you, not just because you act exactly the way that I want you to, but because I actually see you and I value who you are not just what you do. And think about how important that is with the people closest to us. We can often be the most critical and the most negative with the people we love the most. How crazy is that? So appreciation, as simple as it is, it's actually not always easy to practice. But if you start thinking about the people around you, the people who work with you, the volunteers you engage with, the people in your family, the people in your community, the people at work, wherever, start thinking about what do I appreciate and value about them? And do I let them know? It's one of the simplest but most powerful things that you can do. One of the greatest gifts you can give to other people is let them know what you appreciate and value about them. Does that make sense? All right, so last conversation very briefly with your partner. We talked about mindset. We talked about authenticity. We talked about appreciation. Three fundamental elements in being a leader that can influence people, but also creating that championship team that I like to talk about. Turn back to your partner very briefly and talk about what can you take away from this and actually use in your real life, in the real work that you do that's so important to you. Talk about that briefly, and then we'll wrap this up. Um, so... Uh, So we're going to wrap up here in just a moment. I got, I got a couple questions for you, a couple little reminders, and then uh, one last story I want to share just to wrap this all up. Um, so my two questions are related to the promises that I made at the beginning. So you got to tell me the truth, right? Did you have some fun? OK, good. More important than that, did you get some things or get reminded of some things from this that you can take and actually use? OK. Look, you're doing really important work in the community. It's important to acknowledge and appreciate yourself for that. But also to take some of this from tonight. If anything inspired you or reminded you of something you already know or maybe some new ideas came or thoughts or, oh, 
put it into practice. Right? As I said at the beginning, this is not rocket science. This is not like, oh my gosh, I've never heard this before. This is, these are simple ideas. They're just not always easy to practice. But if you're going to have the kind of influence you want to have on people, it starts by practicing. Not perfection, but practice. All right, now I'll stick around after if you have questions or want to chat with me. I did bring a few copies of my books if you're interested in those. Um, but happy to chat with you and stay in touch. And I do really appreciate the work that you're doing in the community. It's important. So this last story that I want to share um, just kind of brings a bit full circle kind of what we've been talking about tonight, the importance of mindset, and in particular, the importance of being grateful. Right? Again, it's easy to be grateful in hindsight. The challenge is often to be grateful in the midst of whatever's going on. We can't always see how it's all going to turn out, right? But I had an experience. You know, I shared with you as we started tonight a bit about, you know, I hurt my arm, and I learned a lot from that experience. But a few years back, I had another experience related to that that really underscored and sort of deepened the experience for me. I was in the car with my older daughter, Samantha, who at the time was four. She's nine now. And we were driving to a baseball game, just me and her. My wife, Michelle, and our youngest, Anna Rose, who was about a year and a half at the time, were home, and it was just a little one-on-one -on -one time with Samantha. And we're driving, actually, to Berkeley to go see Cal and Stanford play, college baseball game. And Samantha, who's sitting in her little booster seat in the back, says to me, hey, Daddy, hey, Daddy, are you going to play in the game? Very sweet, right? She knew that I had played at Stanford, and she won, right? And I said, no, honey, Daddy's not going to play. Well, why not? I said, uh, well, you know, honey, Daddy doesn't play baseball anymore. Well, why not? And then I realized, like, you know, she's young. I guess I'd never really told her the whole, right, what happened. I mean, so then I start to explain to her. Well, you know, I got her. And first she's like, a little, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine now, you know. And she's like, what happened? And, you know, she's, but, but, you know, like a four-year-old trying to sort of comprehend the whole thing. It takes, her, it takes her a little while. And then she goes, okay, oh, I get it, Daddy. I get it. You mean you can't play baseball anymore? And I said, well, yeah, I, that, that's right. And then she asked me a question that I wasn't quite prepared for. She said, Daddy, are you sad about that? And I, st I stopped for a second, and I said, oh. I said, no, you know, honey, I'm not sad about it. I said, listen. I was sad when it happened. I mean, I was really sad because it was kind of a big deal. I said, but that was a long time ago. I'm not sad about it anymore. I said, in fact, you know what, honey? I'm grateful. And she said, grateful? Grateful? Because even at four years old, she knew what grateful meant. We talk about gratitude a lot at our house. Grateful. Why are you grateful, Daddy, that you hurt your arm and you can't play baseball anymore? I don't understand. And I said, well, honey, you know, if Daddy never hurt his arm, I never would have met Mommy. And I wouldn't be your daddy. And then I burst into tears. <laughs> and she was like, Daddy, are you okay? And I was like, whoa, yeah, oh, I'm fine. Oh, boy, whoa. It, like, shocked me how emotional I got in that moment. And I have no idea if she got it. <laughs> but I know that I got it at a whole deeper level. Look, the issue isn't whether or not we're going to have challenges in life, in our communities, in our families, in our schools, and Look, the challenges are there. They're always going to be there to some degree. The question is, how are we going to face those challenges? What mindset are we going to bring to it? Can we be authentic about it? And can we genuinely, genuinely focus on the good stuff and look for what there is to appreciate in the midst of all of that? If we can do those things, as simple as they are, not easy, then we can really create that championship team around us. Thank you very much. Thank you.